Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 20th webinar in the Offshore Wind series, Learning from the Experts. I am Leila Lashmawi, a project manager on NYSERDA's Offshore Wind team, and it is my pleasure to be joined today by today's expert, Hannes Feifenberger with the Brattle Group. Before I introduce our speaker, a few reminders for participants and some background on this webinar series. Next slide, please. Firstly, if you're experiencing any technical issues, please contact Sal Graven at the email address on the bottom of this slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation for slides for all webinars in this Learning from the Expert series will be available on NYSERDA's website at the address on this slide. All participants have been muted. Uh, we will have time for Q&A following the presentation, so please use the Q&A function to submit your questions for the speaker. Next slide, please. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is a critical component in achieving the state's goals of 70% renewable sources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. To provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible, impartial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics of interest, NYSERDA is hosting this educational webinar series called Learning from the Experts to connect the public with independent experts in key topics in offshore wind. We endeavor to select Learning from the Experts speakers based on their expertise, not necessarily for an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA or the state of New York. If you would like to suggest a topic or a speaker for a future webinar, you can email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov. So please note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation uh, are those of the speaker. Next slide, please. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Hannes Feifenberger. Hannes is an economist with a background in electrical engineering and over 25 years of experience in wholesale power market design, renewable energy, electricity storage, and transmission. He is also a senior fellow at Boston University's Institute of Sustainable in uh, Energy, a visiting scholar at MIT's Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research, uh, and serves as an advisor to research initiatives by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, Energy Analysis and Environmental Impacts Division at the U.S. Department of Energy, or the DOE, uh, Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. So, uh, we're super excited to have you. Hannes is uh, a friend of the show, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Hannes. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Uh, let me get uh, my slides up. Um, oops. It's a real pleasure jo um, joining you for this. Uh, we have a packed hour ahead with uh, a number of topics, uh, a little bit of background on transmission planning and why that makes uh, offshore wind development challenging. And then we specifically go into some uh, topics on offshore wind transmission, which, uh, you know, is quite complex and uh, the industry is still in the process of figuring this all out. Uh, on transmission planning, um, you know, why are we here? I think what's happening is offshore wind has made tremendous technological progress. And I like this slide by Bohm that really shows just how much technological progress there has been. Uh, the standard uh, wind turbines that are now being installed offshore, offshore are already 12 megawatts per turbine. And, uh, you know, uh, we hear people already planning to install 14 megawatt turbines. And uh, as this chart shows, uh, the sky may be the limit with uh, some uh, advanced uh, research projects uh, contemplating up to 50 megawatt large turbines. Um, that, of course, requires transmission of bringing these uh, wind turbine generated electricity uh, to shore, and then we need to integrate it into the transmission grid that already exists on shore to supply uh, 
um, loads. And that is uh, really quite the challenge because we are already talking about 30,000 megawatts of current commitments in the eastern US. There are probably going to be several thousand megawatts of floating offshore wind um, on top of that in in the west and, and maybe Maine. But we see that New England, New York, and the mid-Atlantic states have already com contracted for about 12,000 megawatts of wind, and they're already committed to about 30 gigawatts of wind by around 2035. But these are just the current commitments. Based on decarbonization pathway studies, we see that New England and New York alone might each require about 25,000, if not more, megawatts of offshore wind to meet the economy-wide decarbonization goals. Uh, the chart here just shows that um, the forecast installation of offshore wind is in fact on track to get us to about 22 to 30 gigawatts by 2030. And that's only eight years away. So we are really ramping this up very quickly and interconnecting all that offshore wind generation to shore and integrating into the grid is a challenge because transmission in general is a challenging areas area. We do invest about 20 to 25 billion dollars into the existing transmission grid every year. This does not include any offshore. But this is the grid that the offshore wind has to be connected to. And um, we don't have great transmission planning processes to make this as smooth as one would hope it could be, because most of this transmission planning is reactive in response to, um, you know, reliability um, requirements that are being addressed sort of incrementally one generation interconnection at a time. And this is what the planning, the grid planning process looks like. Uh, we do a lot of transmission planning for the local uh, grid needs. Uh, this is important if you want to interconnect solar in upstate New York, for example. But then for interconnecting new generators, there's this generation interconnection uh, process where each generator has to uh, request interconnection and that might be studied for several years before an interconnection is possible. So this generation interconnection process is really holding up a lot of uh, renewable development because it takes so long to get through that. And then there's this sort of long-term reliability planning and what's called regional here is, you know, uh, region for the regional system operator, New York itself is a planning region, but other uh, planning regions like PGM south of New York might include 13 states. Um, and the last two boxes that we have here would be holistic planning of future needs. And that is not really happening very much. The notable exception, however, is that New York has a public policy transmission planning process, which is really working quite well, but is not fully integrated with the generation interconnection process. So how that will play out in New York uh, is still a open question because this coordination between the regional statewide grid planning and the generation interconnection process is really um really still needs to be figured out and when it comes to the interregional planning of um, not just planning for new york as a region or pjm as a region or new england as a region but really uh, planning um, grid needs that might interconnect new england with new york with new jersey and virginia and so on that kind of interregional planning is not really happening yet uh, in the country, uh, not for onshore and certainly not for offshore. Um, and there have been a number of studies, which I will show you that suggest that this would really be necessary. This type of interregional planning 
is particularly challenges, challenging because of a number of barriers. I won't go through these 11 barriers, which we have documented here in a survey, but everyone you talk to can immediately identify a few barriers of why this is not happening. Um, but as you talk to people, uh, they're not all the same barriers and the uh, number of barriers that need to be addressed before interregional planning and transmission development might be possible are really quite extensive. Um, to make this all work better, we know what could be done or what should be done, and that would really be to proactively plan for all future generation needs. We know where the states are going with the clean energy standards. We know how much renewables we need to integrate into the grid. We can do the grid planning to make that possible, um, but we have to connect the dots um, and connect that kind of proactive grid planning to the generation interconnection process. Um, because the future is uncertain, we need to do robust planning that works across several future outcomes. Um, but we know how to do that. It's just uh, not currently being done, and I won't go into too much of the details there. But coming back to New York, uh, New York is very proactive in this, and um, um, just last year published the New York Power Grid study which really had three components, a utility study that addressed the local transmission needs within all the bubbles that you see on this chart, the sort of local, uh, the local on-ramps for renewables, uh, for um, onshore wind and, and solar. There was an offshore wind study that identified grid needs to get 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind integrated into the existing grid. And then there was the zero emission study part of that broader power grid study, which really put it all together to figure out what our bulk transmission and generation needs that would get the state to a zero emissions grid by 2040. And NASERTA has not stood still since um, the power grid study was done with various uh, subsequent studies, including um, some research on how to coordinate bringing all that offshore wind to shore and possibly mesh uh, the lines that bring these um, wind plants to shore uh, for a future mesh grid uh, configuration. Um, <clears throat> how challenging this all is, is illustrated in this chart where you see that uh, the share of hydro, solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, and battery storage is expanding tremendously uh, between now and 2030 and certainly 2040. And you can see offshore wind has an important role to play here, but it's of course not the only um, renewable resource that the state will need to integrate. Um, what this also shows that to make a zero emission grid work by 2040 uh, will need a large amount of battery storage uh, to deal with the intermittency of wind and solar, but also some thermal power plants that are running on renewable natural gas as a backstop for when, you know, the entire state might be in a snowstorm for, for a few days. Um, of course, the state is not an, an island uh, and it is already integrated into the existing grid, but there are significant national studies going on to explore how the grid will have to evolve further to make this all work if um, most of the US or many of the states within the US also would want to achieve a deep de decarbonization of their economy and certainly the electricity grid. And um, some folks are talking about a macro grid akin to the national highway system that would make it easier to um, diversify intermittent renewables across the entire footprint and, and bring low cost resources from various parts of the US uh, 
together into a more reliable, more cost effective system. But you also see on the right here that folks are thinking about what an offshore grid might look like to really uh, integrate the significant offshore wind resources that this country has off the East Coast into the um, onshore grid. Um, how to do that is currently being studied by uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab. The so-called Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study is a two-year study effort that has been kicked off this year. It will study um, what the low cost and most reliable solutions might be both for 2030 and 2050. And um, you have a link here. So if you are interested in exploring the scope of this study a little bit further, uh, this slide deck will point you that way. Um, many studies have found that um, a larger interregional transmission grid, a more robust national grid would be highly beneficial. Uh, there's almost no doubt about that. But what we are seeing in some of these studies, like this is the MIT study from last year, is that um, you can achieve decarbonization goals with less interregional transmission. It's just going to be more expensive. Uh, what you see here is two examples that were explored in the study. One is a robust interregional grid study that, as you can see, achieves the by far the lowest cost on a national level. But if you don't build out the interregional transmission, as seen in this middle map here, uh, reaching a renewable energy goal or a zero emission goal um, is about 20% more expensive because you need more local resources, you need more storage, you need more backup resources and so on. So the choice of whether we want to get to a lower cost uh, regional and interregional grid is, is really ours. But as you know, building this kind of transmission infrastructure is very challenging because uh, transmission lines face tremendous opposition. Um, there is significant interest right now um, in exploring this further. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking coming out to improve transmission planning. And at the national level, DOE has just initiated a new national transmission planning study to explore what a stronger uh, national transmission grid might look like and uh, what it might take to, to get us there. But the challenge with all these studies, including uh, the uh, New York Power Grid study, is that having a study doesn't mean any transmission will actually get built. Um, some of these studies are a little bit aspirational, a little bit hypothetical. They're not able to establish a clear need for individual transmission lines in specific locations that where the need is strong enough to support permitting of the projects. And if you don't have a strong need that you can document, uh, it's virtually impossible to develop a, a transmission line. Um, so connecting the study phase to a planning phase, to a permitting phase is still what needs to happen because we already know that a more robust grid would uh, reduce the cost of decarbonizing the grid, but um, we do need to connect these studies to the actual planning processes and generation interconnection processes that can um, make things work. Um, so now let's focus on offshore wind transmission specifically. Uh, we'll briefly talk about the type of transmission configurations that are being explored to bring offshore wind to shore and the pros and cons of these um, options with some case studies from uh, around the world and uh, New England, New York, and New Jersey. And then we'll talk a little bit about the mesh-ready offshore wind transmission, 
that NYSERDA is currently exploring. Generally, um, what the transmission that is needed to bring offshore wind to shore is a submarine link to shore. You can see that in, in the yellow, that's the yellow line in this chart, you need to connect the turbine to an offshore substation and then connect the offshore substation to shore. Once you're in shore, you're probably not quite uh, reaching the existing grid, so you need an, an onshore link to the existing grid, that's the orange line here, and then to link a lot of, or to inject a lot of power into the existing grid, you very likely have to upgrade the existing grid, which is the green lines here. So coordinating these three transmission construction activities can be challenging, particularly if there are a lot of upgrades to the existing grids that, that are needed because that involves different transmission owners, it involves uh, challenging onshore permitting, and so on. And you can see we would have to use a whole lot of that because we have about 33 lease areas, uh, different, um, you know, offshore wind development areas that would all require these kinds of connections to shore. And um, you can see there would be a lot of cables coming to shore if, if each of these uh, lease areas would rely on several cables to bring its wind power and integrate it into the existing grid. Um, we talked about the ISOs generation interconnection process. These are really the processes that are the only available processes for connecting uh, new uh, generators to the grid, whether onshore and offshore generators. But it is a very incremental process. The study process can take several years. There's a lot of cost uncertainty. You might uh, put in an interconnection request at a certain location. The ISO studies it and then uh, you'll find out it would cost $500 million to upgrade the existing grid if you were to look uh, use this location. So after two years, you might find out that it's not cost effective to interconnect at a certain point. And that's where some planning, some regional transmission planning would really help. Um, we'll show you some examples of how this might work, but some of this is already happening in New York uh, because the New York's public policy transmission planning process right now is um, soliciting solutions to upgrade the export capability from Long Island to the rest of the state so that more wind could be integrated into the grid on Long Island. Um, but to do this cost effectively would really need to require would would require a study that would say, where the ISO, for example, the New York ISO would says, here's how you can integrate 10,000 megawatts most cost effectively. And, uh, you know, ultimately maybe uh, the ISO New England, New York ISO and PGM could work together on something like this. We're not quite there yet, but um, hopefully over the next years, we see some more coordination and some more proactive planning to really capture the synergy, uh, the synergies that this coordinating coordinate, uh, coordination would provide. So um, how can you do this specifically and bring offshore wind to shore? Here, for examples, the upper left shows the current approach that each wind farm has its own gen tied to shore to connect to the onshore grid. <clears throat> um, you could modify this and say, you know, we want to interconnect these gen ties um, through a mesh offshore. So you have meshed gen ties that would, you know, increase the reliability with which onshore wind, offshore wind could be de delivered to shore. Because if one of these gen ties has an outage, uh, you could still use the connections to the other gen ties to bring some of that offshore wind to shore. 
Europe has also explored shared collector station approaches where several wind farms would be connecting to an offshore substation and then one very high capacity cable would bring the output from these wind farms to shore. And then uh, there's the concept of a backbone grid where you would have basically an offshore grid that can collect uh, the output from several wind farms and then inject them into several um, locations on the onshore grid. The benefit of the mesh grid and the backbone grid is that the offshore links can actually be used to reinforce the onshore grid because you can basically connect uh, this part of the onshore grid to the other part of the onshore grid, say, northern New Jersey to southern New Jersey through the offshore links. Uh, but planning that kind of transmission configuration, of course, uh, takes time and effort and has, is challenging because the offshore wind generators can't necessarily wait for such a grid to be developed and the states, including New New York want to procure offshore wind more quickly than it than the time it would take to fully develop such an offshore grid. Um, in terms of pros and cons, uh, a lot of words on this slide, but generally a offshore a planned offshore grid um, has significant advantages if you can use large capacity cables like uh, 1200 to 1600 megawatt HVDC circuits uh, when several offshore wind plants are close to each other so connecting them uh, to each other offshore is fairly inexpensive um, you might have to do that kind of offshore grid planning if you have very scarce right-of-way very few landing points New York is in a very unique situation because you have relatively little coastline compared to uh, New England or uh, PJM. And uh, the best interconnection points in New York would be in the New York City area, but getting to New York City area is very challenging, uh, as I will show you in, in, some, uh, in a couple of slides. Um, the redundancy of having a mesh grid, of course, would be an advantage and providing a transmission solution to reduce the risk of the interconnection process to allow offshore wind generators to uh, connect more easily would also create more competition and including competition between transmission developers because you can really do a solicitation uh, where the most experienced and most cost-effective transmission developer would uh, be able to build the needed offshore grid. Um, but risk mitigation is very important and uh, a lot of that relates to project on project risk. There were some uh, initial hiccups when this was tried in Europe where the offshore grid that was built by a third party was delayed. So the offshore wind developer was ready, but couldn't inject. And, you know, that would be a real problem if uh, uh, the wind developer is spending billions of dollars to develop the wind farm and the link to shore is arriving late. This kind of project and project risk um, is typically managed by the wind developer insisting to uh, also build the transmission to shore. So the same party uh, is responsible for both legs of that project, which would reduce risk. But subsequently, uh, in Europe at least, uh, folks have found ways to address this risk by uh, pre-building transmission with enough lead time and providing strong performance and completion incentives that really align the interests of the division, transmission developer and the generation developer. Um, another way to get to a mesh grid, of course, would be to uh, 
uh, procure individual wind farms with individual gen ties, but do so in a way such that these gen ties could later be meshed together into an offshore grid. And uh, Nasota is trying to do that, as I will explain in a couple slides. When analyzing the benefit of a plant grid, um, you quickly realize that with at least some planning, one can significantly lower the um, onshore upgrade costs by trying to figure out where to best interconnect to the existing grid. You can actually avoid a lot of uh, very expensive um, onshore transmission upgrades that uh, you wouldn't be able to avoid easily under the current approach, which just is based on one generation interconnection request at a time. Um, we also find that by planning the offshore grid, you can use higher capacity lines and just have fewer landing points, fewer environmental impacts, fewer disturbances um, of, of the ocean floor. And um, just, um, you know, significantly reduced permitting risks and environmental impacts. Let's talk about a few real examples. This is a recent study in the UK, uh, trying to figure out how they could integrate um, an additional 18 to 40,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2030 to 2040. And the map here is shown for 2030. Um, the current approach on the left is just using, you know, one transmission line per wind farm. And you can see there are many transmission lines that will come to shore with many onshore interconnection points. Um, whereas if you do a planned approach uh, where you rely on offshore grids and higher capacity lines, you can see there are many fewer lines. And it also means by putting the lines into the right locations that might be a little bit more distant from, from the wind farms, but um, are a strong portion of the grid, you can actually reduce costs tremendously. This UK study found that this planned solution reduces the total cost of the transmission solutions by about 19%, 20%, but it reduces the number of landing points by 50 to 70%. So it means half the landing points, half the environmental impacts, half the cable miles in, in the ocean floor. Um, the UK study also found that waiting only five years before doing this would reduce the benefits by half. So in other words, the longer you continue with the current approach on the left, the less likely you are to realize the benefits that a planned approach on the right could provide. Uh, that, of course, gets us into a real challenging situation because we are eager to bring offshore wind online, build those wind farms, bring them to shore. And the current approach on the left is really what we know how to do now. The planning approach on, on the right here, uh, we, are, we don't quite have the institutions and the processes to do this kind of planning to pre-build pre uh, these kinds of transmission solutions ahead of time and address the project on project risk that I've mentioned before. Taking the same concepts back to the US, this is a result from a study we did uh, for New England. Um, you see the wind lease areas of uh, Martha's Vineyard here and bringing uh, that offshore wind to shore with the current approach of using individual chan ties um, and mostly alternating current chan ties. So each transmission line would only um, deliver up to 400 megawatts. You really see that you need a lot of cables 
and each of these cables would try to get to a nearby landing point on shore. And if you do that, what you see with the red lines um, within New England, you have major overloads of the existing grids that would require significant upgrades to the existing grid before these landing points would be feasible. If we do a plant grid uh, using higher capacity HVDC line and uh, planning interconnection points on the existing grid that avoid uh, major upgrades to the existing grid, you'll see that the interconnection points are much further away. You might have to get all the way to the Boston area or to the South Southern Connecticut area. But what you can also see is you have few cables, about half the cable miles in the ocean floor, uh, fewer landing points, fewer beach crossings, and fewer overloads and upgrades needed for the onshore grid. Um, you spend more on the longer cables, but you spend a lot less on the onshore upgrades and the risk of these onshore upgrades not being possible because of permitting challenges are also much smaller. Uh, this is just a map showing you where the grid, the onshore grid in New England would be overloaded if uh, the current approach continues of bringing offshore wind to the uh, most nearby interconnection points. Um, we've estimated that there would be about $2.5 billion in onshore transmission upgrades. So, it, uh, but beyond the cost, it's really a question of timing and, and the risk of these upgrades not being ready in time to interconnect the offshore grid. Um, I mentioned earlier NYSERDA's offshore wind integration study that was part of the uh, power grid study. Um, that was a really uh, visionary effort to do the kind of proactive planning that would be necessary to find uh, feasible low-cost solutions. And the study found that if you carefully select the interconnection points by choosing the most robust and reachable uh, points on, on, the on, on the onshore grid, integrating 9,000 9, megawatts into the New York grid is feasible without major near-term bulk transmission upgrades beyond what the state has already on, uh, on the development. It would, however, require that 5,000 to 7,000 megawatts of that 9,000 megawatts would be routed into New York City. So only about 2,000 to 4,000 megawatts would need to connect to Long Island. That is a lower cost solution because the grid in New York City is a lot more robust than the grid on Long Island. But getting uh, five to th 7,000 megawatts into New York City is very challenging um, because of uh, routing constraints. Making this all work also requires um, planned coordination of battery deployment, uh, the routing and, and permitting, and how to develop um, offshore wind interconnection points uh, in the city that actually have the space to uh, accommodate these interconnections. Um, you all are very uh, much familiar with the geography in, in New York. Uh, you know, getting wind on to Long Island is challenging because there are a lot of uh, environmentally sensitive areas along the shoreline the grid in Long Island is not very strong, but getting um, cables into New York City has to go through the narrows. Uh, the inner harbor is extremely constrained. There's a lot of existing infrastructure. So making this a reality does require a lot of careful planning. Uh, 
And Nasura, in fact, is um, pursuing several of these planning efforts to facilitate uh, how these uh, kind of that kind of infrastructure could be uh, realized. Um, this just shows again that if you plan carefully, you can have lower impacts uh, by using higher capacity cables that go into the right locations, even if those locations are more distant from the wind lease areas. Um, I want to briefly talk about uh, an effort of how this could be done uh, that uh, New Jersey has initiated uh, with PGM. PGM is the grid operator south of New York. As I said before, uh, PGM covers about 13 states. Um, you know, several of those states, uh, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, um, have significant offshore wind goals. And um, PGM is now in the midst of a process that they call the state agreement approach, where a state or a group of state can come to PGM and say, we need um, transmission infrastructure to um, meet our public policy goals. Please plan that infrastructure for us. And PGM has in fact initiated a state agreement approach to bring up to 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind generation on uh, to shore. And last year has bid out um, that challenge and has subsequently received about eight, 80 proposals from 13 bidders that would uh, <clears throat> provide a combination of solutions um, both the onshore upgrades that you see in green here, the links that are needed from the existing grid to uh, interconnection points near the shore, the orange lines on, on these maps, but also the yellow lines out to the wind lease areas and options to connect these wind lease areas through the blue lines that you see on this map. So PGM is currently evaluating these 80 proposals from 13 bidders uh, with the New Jersey BPU. We at Brattle are supporting the BPU in this effort and uh, the BPU will have to select um, solutions later this year. They might um, so select solutions that can bring the state to 7,500 7, megawatts or they may select smaller solutions uh, any kind of combinations of uh, onshore upgrades and, and, and offshore links is possible. But it shows you that by planning it for the full scale of needed interconnections with the grid operators, you can then actually make these onshore upgrades and um, build the infrastructure to make this all work in the most cost effective way. Um, this has significant advantage over the generation interconnection process where every wind farm would have to do this on its own and with great uncertainty about the cost and the timing of when these offshore onshore upgrades uh, would be made available. Um, finally, I want to spend a few moments on uh, something that SURDA has been uh, doing in the last year, and that is the concept of a mesh ready offshore wind farm. Uh, the idea here is that uh, NYSERDA might be procuring wind farms with a gentai to shore, but these wind farms would have a mesh ready offshore substation. Um, we've done some work with Siemens and Hatch to estimate that uh, pre-building a mesh-ready offshore substation would cost about $40 million more than a traditional substation. And that's about 1% of the total cost of a 
a large offshore wind plant. The advantage of having several mesh-ready wind farms is that if and when uh, you want to mesh them together in, in the future, you could in fact do so. Um, we've estimated that uh, it would take about 120 to 240 million dollars per link to uh, build these links in the future. And NYSERDA, as you may know, currently has out a draft RFP for its 2022 offshore wind solicitation uh, that would in fact require that each proposal uh, utilize or uh, provide the option to utilize HVC technology and meet mesh re ready standards. Uh, NYSERDA has in fact put out uh, draft technical requirements uh, that would uh, set out the kind of standards that each uh, wind developer would um, have to meet in order to allow uh, for its uh, offshore substation to be meshed with others in the future. Uh, we found that uh, doing so for New York, for example, of meshing offshore wind plants connected into Long Island with offshore wind plants connected into New York City would likely provide about $60 million in annual benefits um, if the cost of creating these links would be $200 million. You can see this would be a payback of only a few years. Um, so a fairly low cost option to procure mesh ready offshore wind plants uh, with the possibility to mesh them in the future. So that gets us to the end of this presentation. I uh, just wanna say that we have to keep in mind that we have 30,000 megawatts of offshore wind commitments in the Eastern US already. Uh, this would require about 1,500 to 3,000 miles of offshore transmission cables, plus significant onshore uh, reinforcements. Uh, under the traditional approach, we would have about 75 landing points with beach crossings and about 3,000 miles of cables going to the wind farms. With a plant grid, we can reduce the cable miles by about half to about 1,500 miles, and we can probably reduce the number of landing points from 75 to probably just 25. So some proactive planning like this uh, will be necessary to make this work. Uh, and even in places with a lot of shoreline, we may want to do that just to minimize the environmental impacts. Um, and planning and a backbone grid is challenging. Um, uh, it, it should be done maybe for the second round of uh, wind development in the US but possibly a way to get there more quickly would be uh, to rely on mesh ready procurement because not only would you be able to mesh together uh, wind farms in uh, with gen ties to Long Island and New York City, but you might be able to mesh together a wind farm of Martha's Vineyard delivering power to Queens with a wind farm next door delivering power to Boston. And by creating a mesh grid, you would actually be able to reinforce the onshore grid by creating a new link between Boston and New York City and between New York City and New Jersey and Virginia. Um, we'll have to see where this takes us, but let me stop here and hand it back to Leila. All right. Thank you, Hannes. Um, so we'll, we have a few questions in the queue uh, for Q&A, so we'll just dive right in. Uh, and if, if you need to pull up slides, you, you, you can do that again. Okay. Uh, so we, we have a question here about um, uh, headroom and points of interconnection, which I think you mentioned in about the middle, midway through your presentation. So NISO completed uh, some transmission studies in preparation for offshore wind back in the mid uh, 2010s and identified four substations uh, north of New York City um, with headroom to accept additional voltage uh, and the ability to expand up there. I don't know if you know what this is in reference to. 
Um, is the offshore wind program going to to begin investigating those as interconnection points or are still limited to zones J and K? Um, I don't know uh, that uh, 10 year old NISO study. Um, I do know that NYSERDA's offshore wind study evaluated about uh, at least 20, maybe more uh, interconnection points. And uh, those four were probably part of that. Uh, the reason why the offshore wind study sponsored by NYSERDA found that you could interconnect 9,000 megawatts without major new transmission bills is because the uh, wind farms were optimized in terms of their interconnection points. So the idea was exactly to find the interconnection points with enough headroom to interconnect um, uh, the offshore wind to the existing grid. The challenge, of course, is that a lot of headroom is on the most robust part of the grid, um, which really is New York City that also has a lot of load, so it could easily absorb the injected offshore wind. But uh, getting um, it offshore lines to these interconnection points, whether it's New York City or further up um, the East River or the Hudson, um, you know, you still need to get through the Narrows or come in through Long Island Sound, and none of that is very easy. But I don't know about the specifics of the four substations that uh, this question was about. All right. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, there's another question in here. How is land availability and stakeholder concerns taken into account? Uh, in the greater state driven initiative for predetermined offshore wind connection points? Yeah, very good question. Uh, because uh, interconnection points do require land. Uh, you might need to expand a substation. If you use HVDC lines, you need to have the space for a converter station. Um, it takes land, and land in, in downstate New York is very scarce. Um, I think NYSERDA is currently doing some studies looking at this. I think all the offshore wind developers, of course, are doing their own uh, research on trying to find interconnection points. Um, the low hanging fruit might be to, uh, so to speak, to recycle some of the um, interconnection points of existing uh, fossil generators in the downstate area. You know, the downstate area, I think, has about 19,000 megawatts of um, fossil plants, and some of them are quite sizable. So, and some of them are near to, near to shore. So, it might be possible to coordinate with these existing onshore wind generators to repurpose uh, their facilities into an onshore wind injection point or points of interconnection it might even be possible to use the existing fossil plant as as a backup in case there's no wind uh, that fossil plant could in the future be converted to renewable natural gas as the NYSERDA uh, zero emissions uh, study has in fact found so that kind of coordination with stakeholders is very important. I understand that NASERDA has reached out to other state agencies to start the process of uh, exploring the options. But um, that's just about all I know about this process. <laughs> Thank you. It's was pretty, pretty thorough. Um, realizing we, we do have about five minutes left, but there's a lot of really good questions in here. So uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, what is the cost differential long term of meshed ready versus a totally planned transmission? So I think this question is getting at what is uh, what is the cost of just doing it all at once versus taking this incremental step? What is that step save? Is it saving or is it not? Um, that question has not been fully sorted out. 
um, they have pros and cons. The um, theoretically having a fully planned grid uh, can be lower cost. Um, the challenge is uh, that you may not have the time to fully plan and pre-build the grid before you want to get some of the wind on shore, unless you carefully plan that grid into various segments that can then be connected over time so that the build-out schedule works with the offshore wind procurement schedule. It, it's a real challenge. The fact that we don't know where all the wind lease areas are, for example, we might, even if we know where the federal lease areas are, New York does not know which of these lease areas would deliver to New York. So for New York to build an ocean grid to the right lease areas can be challenging if some of these lease areas would then deliver to New England uh, because they are selected uh, in, in RFP. So fully planning out a grid has its challenges, would likely um, could be lower cost because it's more completely planned to do a, a to rely on chain ties that are mesh ready that can later be meshed together, um, avoid some of these uncertainties, um, reduces the risk um, of not being ready in time or not building the right um, lines to the right locations but uh, may not be as efficient as a, a fully planned backbone grid. Uh, we might have a situation where the ideal solution is to do this next round of pro wind procurements with mesh ready um, gen ties that later can be meshed together. And then as we look into the next uh, round of procurements past 2030 that um, maybe the federal government would build an ocean grid from New England to uh, the Carolinas and figure out how to bring the next 30 to 50 gigawatts of offshore wind to shore. Uh, and we would certainly have more time for that next round while the first round of wind projects, maybe the first 30 gigawatts are getting built with either gen ties or mesh ready gen ties or you know some smaller uh, planned grid solutions. Yeah, that uh, you're you sound like you're describing a dream to me almost <laughs> to have have this uh, up and down the coast just built for us. You know, mesh ready seems like you know the uh, what we're able to do on our scope is. Uh, anyways, we have a long road ahead. <laughs> Uh, a, a question here on um, the difference of HVDC and HVAC cable. Uh, is there a reason that AC cables are not looked at at the same level of HVDC? And there's another note. This can be possible by designing the right converter um, at the uh, wind turbine, allowing long distance AC possible. Um, good question. Um, long distance AC is a challenge. Um, the good news is none of the wind areas are far enough away to make AC impossible. So it's certainly possible to have AC solutions. The challenge with AC is that uh, as distance increases, the losses increase tremendously. Um, so uh, you lose much more along the way. And one AC cable right now can only handle about 400 megawatts, while a DC cable can handle 1200 megawatts or 1500 megawatts or even more. So for every DC cable, you, need, you would need about three to four AC cables, which of course has more impact. And you know, once you get to the lease areas that are a little bit further out, uh, you sort of get to the crossover point where HVDC actually becomes cheaper than HVAC, but you know, one of the biggest consideration for New York specifically is you may not have the right of way to bring 9,000 megawatts to shore with just AC cables because you would need uh, too many AC cables, so many that you can't even physically get them into the New York Harbor. And so you may want to use HVDC cables to use 
the ocean floor and, and the right of way more efficiently. Um, HVDC also has the advantage that the losses over long distance transmissions are much lower. Um, but as I said, um, the distance that we have to the lease areas right now uh, is probably such that from a cost perspective, it might be about the same. Uh, some of the nearby lease areas, it will be cheaper to use a AC cables. But as I said, you need about three times as many cables. Okay. All right. Well, realizing we're we're right at two p.m., uh, there's a lot of real a lot of questions that that we didn't get to. Um, so if if folks would like to submit questions in our inbox, we can always forward them to to Hannes. Uh, and I will. There's several comments in here uh, regarding the mesh ready and the procurement. Uh, and and I might just say that. Our draft uh, offshore wind solicitation, including our mesh ready design is up for comment um, and we're happy for questions. If anything is unclear uh, for those to be submitted in writing, that's not not related to this webinar, but just wanted to address that batch of of, uh, of questions. But uh, thank you for joining us today, Hannes, uh, and for our participants in the audience for this learning from the experts webinar. And to remind folks uh, that this webinar recording and, and the presentation slides will be available at nyserta.ny.gov slash OSW dash webinar dash series. Our next webinar in the series is on April 20th at 1 p.m. Uh, Brandon Capasso and Donald Bullen with WRI will be speaking about weather impacts uh, for offshore wind. So you can register for future webinars through our events page at wind.ny.gov. If you have questions for future topics that you would like to hear about in this series, please email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov. Thank you for joining us uh, today, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.